Well, a study by the South African National Blood Service has found that more people than those diagnosed have been infected uh, with the coronavirus. On Wednesday, the organization released an initial analysis of an ongoing study which tests the blood of donors for sars uh, cough two antibodies and now let's discuss this uh, with uh, Dr. Karen van der Berg uh, she joins us via Zoom. She's a consultant in translation research. Good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell us about this study and how it was uh, conducted. Good afternoon and thank you for having us on your show. For us really the journey for this study started almost a year ago now really in april may we already started planning to do this study we obtained all the necessary ethics approval we finally managed to get regulatory approval for one of the testing platforms that we used and so then in the beginning of january we initiated the study we made sure that on the day that we collected samples which started on the 7th of january all the donors who presented to our clinics in the four provinces that we tested, we informed them about the study, made sure that they gave informed consent and collected the samples from them. And we were then able to use the, the remaining sample from the samples that we would generally use to test their blood for. We would we then use to, to study for the SARS-CoV-2 antibody. What was the problem? What, what did you really initially identify as the issue that needs to be researched? Because, I mean, at, at the time, South Africa was facing COVID-19. There was no vaccine and not yet, you know, having any hope of how it will be kept. So as the numbers were going up with your research, why did you see it very necessary to do it? So it's very interesting. We had hoped to be able to start this research a couple of months ago already because we realized that by looking at our donor population, we would be able to fairly easily monitor how this epidemic evolved over the, over the months. Internationally, for example, in America, donors are actually now tested routinely for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies to be able to track how the epidemic unfolds in different populations, in different states. And certainly, I hope, was and still is, that we would be able to use the relatively easy process of testing the donors to be able to see how the epidemic unfolds, where the pressure points are. We do think that this would be really valuable information for the people who are making policy decisions, that it can help inform how they, how they roll out the various programs related to managing the COVID epidemic. All right, so let's understand the, the, the process of collecting your samples so that you can get data of this particular research. One would take it that before anybody can enter a building where they donate blood, they would be tested. So in case of their temperature is high and suspicion of whether or not if it's high, they have contracted the, the virus. Then for you to do a research that is COVID-19 related and to check if people have antibodies, were you doing it with the expectation that these people could be infected or they could be negative so that you can move from there? So that's a really good question and thank you very much because I think that's very important for our donors and for our staff and, and, and for the patients to understand that we have very strict systems in place that before people, potential donors, enter our donor clinics, we do all the pre-checks, we do the temperature checks, etc. We also ask very specifically the potential donors whether they've been in contact with COVID, whether they have symptoms, and if so, they're not allowed to donate on the day and need to wait for at least 14 days before they can come back. So in addition, if you've had COVID, we would expect you to wait for at least 14 days since the symptoms have cleared. So we were fairly certain that on the day our donors were not actively infected with COVID-19. In fact, we were, what we were trying to look at is whether they have previously in the past, um, most likely at least a month or so before, been in contact with COVID-19. Because it takes about, a, you know, depending on the individual, but anywhere between two and six weeks for the antibodies to actually develop. 
So the antibodies is really an indication of past exposure to SARS-CoV-2, not of a current active infection. All right. So then according to the racial dynamics of South Africa, as uh, one would categorize black, white, Indian, and the colored community. Did it really matter when you were doing uh, your, your, your population sample that you were going to take the results according to uh, the racial bias? Or were you not considering the issue of race at all as a common, common denominator? So when we do seroprevalence work, uh, we, in Sanders, because COVID is not the only uh, you know, infectious disease that we look at, we generally use the self-declared race of donors that enables us to look at um, to what degree the exposures are differ between races. And in this instance, really, what we were trying to look at was to see whether there were differences between the different population groups. Um, as part of the routine work that we do at Sanders. And we were quite surprised to see the really marked differences that we did see between the different racial groups. Did it really matter uh, to get results based on racial dynamics of black, white, colored, Indian? And what specifically are you looking for in the DNA of those racial groups? So uh, there's very clear work having been done internationally that there is no difference in the genetic ability of a person to contract COVID based on race. But what has been shown very clearly is that differential access to health care, different socioeconomic circumstances, um, the, and as I said, the ability to, be, to access for example, a COVID test would influence the distribution of the or the involvement of the virus through particular socioeconomic groups. So for us, we think that race is more a proxy of access to, for example, being tested rather than something that inherently says that you are more likely to get the virus than somebody else. So it's not really a genetic thing but more, I think, a um, socioeconomic situation. Right. So how is this study going to benefit uh, the, the medical fraternity and the whole research process on the impact of uh, the current vaccine rollout as it's at the initial stage? So that is, that is the $6 billion question. I think the work that has been done by Discovery the work that has been done by other researchers, I think helps to inform the work that we have done. And it helps us to be able to track what happens over time. So really the, the, the beauty of the research that we do is that we are able to access different popular or, or different groups of people within our um, South Africa that, for example, have been investigated elsewhere in the Western Cape, for example. And so the value of this is that we can really, if we can just get our um, the different tests that we use approved, we could very easily repeat this study, for example, every two months or so. And that will really help inform the, the policymakers around what is happening, not only with the spread of the virus, but also potentially we would be able to differentiate between people who have had a natural exposure to the virus against those who have developed antibodies, for example, um, in response to being vaccinated. Lead consultant, translational research. Uh, well, of course, uh, Dr. Karin van der Berg, and of course, uh, talking to us about a research or rather a study that has been researched by the South African Black Donor Services. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having us.